Ladies and gentlemen, this episode of the Tiger Pit is brought to you by Unplugged Essentials. Not all hemp is created equal. Instead of using either isolated CBD or cannabis oil, which are the most popular cannabis-derived products on the market right now, they have infused their soaks with water-soluble, hemp-derived, phytocannabinoid-rich powder. This way, their products take advantage of the several hundred bioactive components present in hemp. They make no compromise in quality whatsoever and ensure each batch is lab tested and 100% THC free. You can find them on Instagram at Unplugged Essentials, on Facebook at Unplugged Float Essentials, and online at UnpluggedFloatEssentials.com. And when you go there, use the promo code The Tiger Pit for an additional 10% off your order. We are also brought to you by Knock My Legends. Knock My Legends celebrates the heroes, legends, and icons of Muay Thai and kickboxing. Their mission is to create art in the form of apparel that honors each fighter's contribution to the sport and the art that we love. They have a great selection of apparel and other accessories that highlight the greats of the sport from the past up until today. Great gear if you want to pop a little style while you're training or if you're just a fan of Muay Thai and want to rep the culture. You can go to knockmylegends.com that's N-A-K-M-U-A-Y legends.com as well as Facebook and Instagram and check out what they have and when you're ready to buy something enter the promo code the Tiger Pit for an additional 10% off your purchase. Again, that's knockmylegends.com or knockmylegends on Facebook and Instagram. We are also brought to you by Athlon Rub. Athlon Rub is the next generation in performance and recovery for all sports. Made in an FDA and ISO certified lab in the United States, certified and continually tested by informed choice to be free of banned substances, PEDs, and cross contaminants. You can go to athlonrub.com to look at all the products that they have available, read testimonials from users, and see what everybody is saying. And when you're ready to check out, use the promo code The Tiger Pit for an additional. 10% off. We are also brought to you by Diplomatico Rum. Diplomatico is distributed in over 80 countries throughout the world. It holds the Ron de Venezuela DOC and is recognized as one of the finest rums in the world. They have three different ranges for your tastes, traditional, prestige, and the distillery collection. You can go to rondiplomatico.com, that's R-O-N diplomatico.com, to learn more about who they are and find out some of the history behind one of the world's greatest rums. This is for you uh, New York people out here. We are also brought to you by the Stepping Razor Barbershop at 952 Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn. They specialize in American classic traditional haircuts, styles, and shaves. You can check them out on Instagram at Stepping Razor Barbershop, or you can go to thesteppingrazor.com to book your appointment and get yourself looking good and feeling good. That's Stepping Razor Barbershop, 952 Flushing Avenue, Stepping Razor Barbershop on Instagram, and thesteppingrazorbarbershop.com. And lastly, we are brought to you by the Dojo NYC at 1082 Cypress Avenue in Ridgewood. The Dojo NYC is a fully equipped martial arts training center specializing in Cobrinha Jiu-Jitsu, traditional Muay Thai, and MMA. Whether you want to just get a good workout or compete at a high level, it's a great place to learn and a great place to train. You can go to the dojonyc.com and check out their classes, instructors, and programs, and even sign up for a free trial class. That's the dojonyc.com online and the dojo nyc on Instagram. Okay. A guest on this episode was a political commentator on the comedy news program Redacted Tonight with Lee Camp on RT America. He's been featured in the New York Times, the LA Times, and the Huffington Post, as well as being one of Comedy Central's fresh faces of comedy. He's been a favorite guest on the popular podcast Risk with Kevin Allison. Keith and the Girl, You Made It Weird with Pete Holmes, and Skeptic Tank with Ari Shafir, and is also the co-creator and host of the eight-city hit show, 51st Jokes. Along with performing, he hosts his own podcast, Take Your Pills, Psychopath. It was my first time meeting him, and he had us laughing the whole time. So without further ado, please welcome to the Tiger Pit, also known as J-Fod, Mr. John F. O'Donnell. On the next episode of Adventures and Animals. It's a Kvarian and a Polish guy. Okay, we'll start the podcast, right? 
here. It's nine o'clock. It's dark enough. I'm putting on my ninja suit. That's the part, right? You gotta get into your head. Now you're struggling with your words. Check the Yelp reviews. I'm sure they have like four. It's amazing. I was trying to get that out, and I had a hard time struggling in my head. They just see something they don't recognize. They check out immediately. I had a point. I had a point. Coming to the stage. I've heard this many times from different sources. You didn't even know me when I was hanging out there. That sounds like such a burnout thing to do. Tiger bit. Yeah. Yeah. Increíble. <laughs> Increíble. <laughs> Mi español es pobre. <laughs> Mi vocabulario es como se dice nunca. It's pretty good. Sí. <laughs> Yo puedo hablar la lengua, pero yo no puedo, como se dice, comprender con otras personas habla a mí. Solamente okay. habla, habla, habla. No, escucha, escucha, escucha. Es increíble problema. We can learn this. En el pasado, no, es en, en la escuela, <laughs> y con personas de Sudamérica, quien yo trabajo uh, en, uh, en universidad. Ok. Un poco. Okay. Personas de Honduras y Guatemala y yo soy un poco de un gringo mierda. <laughs> <laughs> Pero yo trato de hablar su lengua de amor. That's like my little. De amor. <laughs> it's like my little. I just gave you my little speaking in Spanish rap that I yeah. did. You know, that's all I got. You do that all the time. All the time. Right? That, like you, if you thought that was like extemporaneous, no, that was just that was my greatest hits. I Danny. thought that was on the fly, yeah. man. I <laughs> was, was like, damn, it's pretty good. I mean, there was a little ad adaptation to it, but that is really that's my greatest <laughs> hits with Spanish. Uh, oh man, Are we rolling. Okay, good. Oh, good, good, I good. The, the, right in it, man. Jump so, um, in, dude. Good, good. We didn't want to miss that gold right there. <laughs> the one clip perfect. you did when you were interviewing, uh, it was like 2016, and you did the clip of the guy you were interviewing in Spanish, but you were like, my country, this country is... Oh, the nonsense Spanish. Country, and this country... Oh, and tu país. This, and then, <laughs> and then, and then, and then you just kept like, saying my country, my country, my And then you're like, please respond in English. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he thought it was funny, though. He did, he did. I always make sure, like... <laughs> That one, I knew what I was doing. I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this nonsense Spanish. Mi país es tu país. Es tu yeah. país es mi país. <laughs> You're like, yeah, I guess. I guess I can't disagree with that. But that, that was so the good. sort of thing. Those were all uh, immigration activists uh, during the last election that were protesting this big uh, uh, Republican primary uh, debate, or they were having a big immigration rally, and nobody was covering it. Except for me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have to do it in a satirical way. So my angle in, with that particular gentleman was for me to be speaking ridiculous Spanish, but to allow him to then mm -hmm. kind of speak at length about what he wanted to talk about. You know, yeah, yeah. like I would make sure with those to never sort of quote unquote punch down, as they say, you know, like I'm never going to mm -hmm. I'm going to play the villain. It has to be light. Yeah. yeah. Well, not necessarily. It's light. like a dance. Yeah. It's like a, it's dance. Like a dance. You're right. Because like, I'm not necessarily I'm not going to I'm going to play the villain, but only to allow the from my the humanistic pro progressive perspective to get out yeah, yeah yeah for that person to talk yeah, about if you punch down then they're like okay then it's the interaction's over yeah and it's mean spirited and it's not yeah, it's mean -spirited, what are we doing yes. yeah, yeah, you know yeah, exactly yeah but that one was fun yeah yeah that, that was, was pretty fun. Fun. How, how how is redacted it's not you're done with it it's well over? i'm i left the show the show is still happening okay yeah uh it's uh it's still happening lee camp is the host i actually just he was just in town um over the weekend, we uh, we hung out. So, but uh, yeah, the show's still going on. I uh, I just you know I put in five years on the show, and I kind of I'm very proud of the work that I did there. But I got pretty burnt out on the politics of it, and they kind of wanted to shake things up with correspondence. I was a correspondent from the beginning, so mm -hmm. you know I decided to leave. Is half the story that I usually tell people publicly. Um, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the PG version. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But the. Uh, the full story is, uh, you know how the old saying goes, Danny, like, have a manic episode and take an extended leave of absence from work once. Shame mm -hmm. on me. Mm -hmm. Have a manic episode and take an extended leave of absence from work twice. You're fired. Even more. <laughs> shame on me and you're fired. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I'm doing fine now. Like, I really hopefully do have things under control, but I, I do struggle with bipolar disorder and I've had these manic episodes here mm -hmm. and there over the years. One of which manifested in uh, your barbershop one day. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember. Which uh, we can get into that in a moment <laughs> if you want to. But uh, which uh, I, I'm actually really interested in hearing from your perspective because I think you just thought I was on drugs or something. Um, no, I didn't think you were on drugs. I, I, I definitely felt like something was happening. You knew something was yeah, going yeah. on? Your eyes were too clear. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah I knew something was up. Yeah. I knew, I knew. I knew you were, it seemed to me at least, that you were like 
struggling in the moment a million miles an hour and you were looking at me, you had this look on your face. You were like looking at me like right in the eyes. And I knew I was like, nah, he's not fucked up. Cause you were looking at me in my eyes way too much. Yeah. And nobody, when they're fucked up, they don't do that. But now the, the another thing that's problematic is I also was being pretty hilarious at the time. You, you I think you I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I just you had I moments was. that you were really funny, but there were moments where I was like, oh my oh, god, god. I, this is fucked up. I have to ask him to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was yeah, like, oh yeah. shit. And I could see that like everybody else was kind of like that knew you were kind of like I don't know. They were looking at me for like guidance, like like is, something, was right? something, yeah, was something was off. Something was off. Yeah, and I was like, oh man. But um, I'm glad to see so that bad. you're doing well. No, no, it was. I mean, I know, on, but man, I can handle that. I know, I know. Crazy. You didn't. You didn't hurt anybody. No, I know. But I brought that weird person in with that guy was weird. He was like, yeah, who was that? I met him on the street like 10 minutes before through some other like a friend guy, of yours through some other guy and and we when then we's like we smoked a bowl or something like that and for me smoking weed when i'm manic it just like throws me off the rails like into outer space so that's like a disaster so apparently that dude was super fucked up too and then he was in there and i remember he was like talking your ear off for a while or something like that and yeah that was, like, i vaguely a weird, remember weird situation remember, yeah i, ba- I don't know. vaguely remember but that. i will just tell you this so like i i knew after the fact that it was like everything was okay but i was so embarrassed about it that it was like hard for me to come back around like, really for my own, i wasn't yeah. that bad i know i know but that's the thing where it's like that's one of the things that you that probably beating yourself up about it yeah, yeah. yeah i was really beating myself up yeah. about it nah, like, it was I have, not like that it's things that have like haunted me like that you know what i mean like and I think about the flip side of it, where it's like, oh, if that was the reverse, and I knew a friend of mine or somebody that I know or mm-hmm. somebody who is was going through something like that, of course I would, you know, forgive them for it. I wouldn't hold it against them. No, of course not. But the flip side of that, sometimes for me, it's harder to find that road to self forgiveness. You know, mm-hmm. that's like yeah. a trickier thing. No, I, I, I hear you. I deal, I deal with that type of stuff too. I it's beat myself up all the time, man. I, I, some, I wake up the next day, I'm like, what the fuck? Was saying i said that shit i shouldn't have said that that was weird you know it's not beating myself up about it that's yeah. the worst thing you can do you know it's like you can't beat yourself up but you just have to accept the situation and be like that can't happen again <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what i'm saying yeah. but you know obviously i move forward from hindsight's it. Yeah. 2020 yeah um so but, yeah that's why i left the job yeah <laughs> 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 but you know what it's okay i was bummed out for sure but i really legitimately i i i'm I was burnt out on the politics thing, yeah. dude. But like, you're so good at it, though. Thank you. But you know what? I, I, uh, you know, we had a, we had a research our own stories, find the stories, research them, write the scripts, and perform them. You know, that's a lot so, of work. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, and I'm not against work. I like working hard, but uh, I, uh, it got really depressing, man. Like at some point, I felt like I was just like there was an endless stream of shit, and I'm just like throwing gumdrops into it. And it's like the gumdrops aren't going to do anything, but you're like, I got to just throw the gumdrops in. What am I going to not throw the gumdrops in, you know? But enough is enough. Some of the stories really started to freak me out. I could tell you about a couple of those. But also, for me now, over all these years doing comedy and having to deal with this bipolar disorder thing and being able to on stage talk about it and getting positive feedback from that from mm-hmm. people feeling appreciative that i do that if there's any chance that i can put more of my creative comedy energy in towards mental health sort of stuff mm-hmm. i feel like a real sort of motivation to do that now and that's what i'm doing with the new stand-up act that i'm mm-hmm. building uh and that's what i'm doing with the new podcast that i'm doing and with just putting my money where my mouth is and actually getting involved if i actually want to help people <clears> and doing yeah. volunteer work with uh, a mental health organization so yeah, yeah yeah i don't know if i could do all that stuff while pursuing the political satire thing and i'm still i still it's too much work right it's like it takes so much time well yeah it, and also honestly i always said that redacted tonight would have been a complete dream job if it was in new york if i didn't have to move to dc oh, for I it see. Yeah, you yeah. know New York just for me quality of life is considerably better. I, is it really? You think so? Well, I don't. Me, I feel like I never hear anybody say that. Well, f- well, I'll tell you why. For me, in terms of network of friends mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. all of that stuff and a support, support system, support. Ah, I see. Uh, and the rhythm of the city actually works better for me. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I'm fucking crazy. I don't know. But uh, but. I don't know. DC is like there's still cool elements of it, but it's so infused with that political. It's such a militarized city, man. Sure, everything, all those, all those, all the kind of like all the areas surrounding DC, all of the counties, and mm-hmm. you know, and stuff like that. It's some of the the wealthiest places in the country. It's totally, you know, you got the, you know, the, the Pentagon's there, the NSA's mm-hmm. there, the FBI, yeah, it's, it's all weird. that stuff. The whole, it's weird it's, energy. It's the government town. It's the center. It's yeah. the political nerve center. So even if you completely try to separate from it, you can't, you can't, even if you're hanging out with your friends, you know, there's one person in that bar that's 
actively hurting humanity every right. day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. weird, yeah. right? Like Stafford, yeah. Alexandria. The last time I was in Quantico was for one of my brother-in-law's retirement ceremonies for uh, well, yeah, these, the Marines, uh, right? Yeah. We were going back to the train station the next day. I was not feeling well because I was buying bottles of champagne. Oh. We're driving past the Pentagon. We living La Vida Loca. That's when I just started <laughs> to throw up. So, like, we're oh, going no. down the freeway driving past the Pentagon. I got my head out the window going, <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> and my brother in law working at the Pentagon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So big go go on, man. <laughs> That's hilarious. So you were the high-ranking military officials <laughs> driving past the bedding on puking out the window? <laughs> they puke on the side of the truck. <laughs> <laughs> there, there it was. I, I felt really bad about that. I felt more bad about the you know little sprinkling of the, of the <laughs> SUV that I did. <laughs> uh, dude, I got to say, though, with, with the redacted tonight, um, the, the part where you went to Lindsey Graham. You're like, <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> you were doing the pints. Oh, that was great, dude. Like, I'm a super fan. I'm a- <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Lindsey Graham I love super you. fan. Who the yeah. who's there? There's no Lindsey Graham super fans. His family doesn't even like him that much. I know. I, I'm watching that and I'm like, does he know he's fucking with him? I'm like, I'm trying to read the people and I'm like, it doesn't. You can't really I, tell. Like, I don't I think, think he I, knows. I figured out this little trick where it's like. They just listen. I end up realizing they just listen to your tone. Yeah, your but you're words. looking at them with this face, like you kind of like got like this, like <laughs> like, like, this, like, like you know what I mean? Like the way you're looking at me, like like it's so kind of excited. excited. Yeah. yeah, like a puppy dog. So how like, can you say no to that? You're like, yeah. yeah, this guy likes me. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like you kind of it I kinda always like, gets them. I kind of like drown them in their own arrogance. It's got to be. He's got. I was just gonna say, it's a certain type of person that falls yeah. for that. Because if you came up to me and did some shit like that, I'd be like, "Fuck you!" Danny, yeah, you my face. <laughs> I'd be like, oh, "Danny, it's so great to meet you. I love your technique." <laughs> I mean, leave now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, get the fuck. What are you trying to? What are you trying? What are you trying to get out of me? Exactly. Well, but well, he's just like, "Oh yeah," and he's yeah, pouring yeah. you a crappy pint. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You're like, "Yeah, you got a lot of head on that, buddy." You're like totally sucking shit to him. Yeah, I called him out. I was like, "Oh, Lindsey Graham pours a pint with a." Big head, all right. Yeah. What? And he's going, oh, I'll give you a job in Washington. Yeah, yeah. He's like, You got it. You come work for me. Fuck, man. These There's guys are dummies, things. man. They are dumb. There's a few things going on here. So, right when I knew that that was going to happen, when, when like the person that was running that event is like, You guys want to have a great, like, thrill for your life? Lindsey Graham's <laughs> going to pour pints behind the bar before the interview. And so, it's like I'm, this big extravaganza. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but who's in there is a bunch of just like, it's a bunch of just, journalists and press people and um, people who were working on the different campaigns. It was just like a private closed event that they invited me into. It's just like <laughs> terrible decision. And uh, so, so once, so <laughs> it's like, what the fuck? I know. How do you even get clearance? Because I, for, because I was part of it, I are on international cable news network. So I had a, so they just give it, they just well, I had a congressional press credential. Which oh, I had fuck. for a few so they don't years. know that it's like satire or like comedy or anything like that. They're just like, okay, no, come in. No, just yeah. And then we had to apply. You apply for press credentials. You would think they would do a little bit more due diligence and like figure out who's gonna fuck with them. Well, I think now it's kind of it kind of got. It's like now I don't know if it would fly. Right, because they've been what exposed what I mean? a little bit. Yeah, like, yeah. Ah, don't don't let right. that guy in. <laughs> yeah, this was kind of like what we what I was able to get away with it a few of those primaries in that first presidential debate. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if that's Do like Do you wish that you were still doing that maybe right now only because of the political climate? I I mean You could do some real damage right now, dude. Yes, but it would be weird actually. Like what would I be doing? Like what would I be like right now? Talking this, mad shit. No, I know, I know, but like in this democratic primary, what would I be doing? Like Oh would I man, be, there's so much. But like to what? Like to like Talk shit about how Joe Biden's yes. brain is liquefying. Yeah. And yes, 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 you know? yes. I mean, I guess, but I mean, you could probably be helping like, a little bit it seems with like that. Elder abuse, dude. It's it, crazy. Hundred percent, it is. Hundred uh, <laughs> you know? percent, it is. That's very it's nice of you. Messed up. <laughs> I, I feel uncomfortable. Yeah, you know? but still. No, I know, I know, but, uh, but people could really, you could really. Cause, uh, let's not let's let's stay there for a second. Does it not does it not seem like he's being cushioned and protected? Yes, it does. Yeah. What the fuck, man. Yeah. So you could go up and be like, hey, man, Joe Biden, pour me a pint. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, he's like, oh. Tell me the name like, of, what's a pint? Yeah, yeah a pint of point. milk. <laughs> tell me the name of all your grandkids. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'd like so to see him messed, rattle that off. So messed up. <laughs> uh, but, but okay, but best, doing, <laughs> doing long division with Joe Biden. <laughs> oh, God. I feel like 80% of Americans can't do long division. But, uh, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but, so, okay, the Lindsey Graham thing, though, you'll have to give them this funny. So, when 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 the person announces that 
everybody at the bar, like nobody cares. Everybody's like, okay, whatever. Yeah, it's, you know? yeah, it was weird. They're like, we're at this thing. Um, but You're the I, most liveliest person oh, in there. Absolutely. But I was immediately like into character. I was like, oh, I'm going to just like be like a method actor. And immediately be like, you guys, isn't this cool? So I start like talking to everybody around me who's waiting in line for this yeah, to yeah. happen. The wall seemed like they were afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What was going on? They were like, what is going on? So my buddy who was with me, the camera dude, uh, he, I was like, it's just uh, you, one guy. That's it. Yeah, me and one guy. And so he put the like the lav mic on me. So I had that mic, but it's sort of like you know little lapel mic. Uh-huh. And then I was like, dude, just set up on the side of the bar. So if I get up there, you can just like get it. And he was just waiting. And then I'm waiting in line with everybody, but I'm talking to people. I'm just like, this is so cool. Lindsey Graham's gonna pour us a pint of it. And they're just like, yeah, I guess. Why man. You so yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so then I remembered. I realized that at the time, what he was complaining about was that he couldn't get on the main uh, debate stage because he wasn't polling at one percent so they were putting all the people that weren't polling one percent on like this jv debate stage that the debate oh, would happen man. earlier it was televised like an hour or so earlier so like oh, nobody would watch it that's horrible so he was really like bummed out about that and his big complaint was saying that he had more national security experience than everybody else combined in the primary because he's on the foreign relations subcommittee or blah, blah, whatever right so that's what I said to him. I go, Lindsay, it's ridiculous. You know, that they put you on the undercard for this debate. You have more foreign policy experience. Oh, the undercard. Than- did you yeah. really call it the undercard? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> that's what they call it. They call it the undercard. They did? Yeah. I thought you just made that up. <laughs> but then this is my, the, I think this was the best part. I go, I go, Lindsay, they keep saying there's not enough room for all the trolls underneath the bridge. That's yeah. ridiculous. Oh. You deserve to be there. So he's like, thank you. So I call him a troll yes. on the DL. And he said, thank um, you to that. That was the little well, moment. Nobody caught that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I actually re- I like jumped back. I was like, did, "Wait, what did he say?" And then, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And then, and then I was like, and Lindsay, it's just, it's so unfortunate. You know, it's like, you know, it's like you're a traditional conservative. It's not enough for you just to be like a, you know, like a regular, like, like psychotic conservative these days. You have to go even further. (laughs) He's like, I know you're telling me, man. (laughs) You're telling me, man. (laughs) Now it did seem like from the interview, interpersonally, Lindsey Graham is a really nice guy. Great. Like go clean my pool, dude. You know, like, but don't, don't be a fucking Senator who now is just like holding Trump's water completely or whatever. But uh, but yeah, those were those were those were some fucking fun moments. But that was the angle. The angle was to just blind them with their own arrogance. Uh, number one, and then another thing I figured out at the first debate was to ask them questions about stuff that I wanted them to Edibles. talk about. No, no, I want. Thank you though. I uh, that I wanted them to talk about, but. They didn't talk about, but then present them as though the questions already happened. Like that's what I did in the first debate. Like I was like, I was like to uh, to uh, what's his name, Jeff Sessions at the time was the attorney general. <laughs> oh my god, the <laughs> right. elf. The yeah, elf. dude, that dude. I was like, I was like, uh, I was like Jeff. I can't believe it's so interesting that uh, that Donald Trump completely reversed his policy on immigration and said that because of the U.S.'s foreign policy history there and what's that's caused to all the different coups and stuff like that that we actually have to have an open border now and kind of in order to that or something like that and he's like i didn't hear that <laughs> where'd you hear that like so i would just make shit up that i wanted to hear about and that kind of worked as a weird angle how, how did know? how did you get on that show well the host of it lee uh we've been friends for a long time oh, okay I so see. from new york and stuff like uh and we always liked each other's comedy uh and so when he was um uh, asking different people to audition and stuff. He asked me to audition. So first it was like the writing sample. So I did the writing submission. Yeah, I was gonna say, what's an audition for that? Like, <clears throat> well, for this particular one, the first part of it was, uh, uh, it was just a number of stories that he sent. Then I had to write kind of satirical pieces about them. Mm-hmm. That was the first part. Um, just to see if like the, I guess to get a sense if there was like the political knowledge base and the kind of comedy writing saying, chops yeah. were there at all. Mm-hmm. And so then after that, it was to come in for like a, a screen it was test. It like writing like an interactive bit or something, right? Yeah, it was interesting. Actually, the, the submission packet was different from what I did from then when we ended up having other cast members after the show got started when we had the, the different sections of the show more fleshed out. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then the submission is basically, because the segment the show is desk segments and uh, you know pre-taped uh, packages and then all of Lee's kind of individual content, his monologues and all that stuff. Uh, so you basically just have to write versions of that, mm. like, you know, as the submission packet. But then there's also then the screen test. So I had to go down to DC and then we wrote a desk segment together 
and we did a screen test of that, see how the chemistry was and see how it looked and if it was funny. And, and that went well. And so then they called me back again to do another one. And then they offered me the job. And so I moved to D.C. like pretty much immediately for it. <coughs> wow. Which I was willing to do. I mean, it took me years and years to get a steady gig in comedy. Um, You're not from there, though. No, I'm from Jersey. You're from Jersey. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'd lived in New York for... That's why you feel more comfortable here. <laughs> what? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, Northeast. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, you know what? And also it's like, I would say in terms of like edginess factor in New York, I'm maybe like a five, but in DC, I felt like I was like a roadie for Marilyn Manson or something like that. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you look too crazy. Yeah, yeah, everybody yeah, else. yeah. Like they won't even let you guys in. You I bet. <laughs> I've been to DC once and I felt like a misfit there for sure. <laughs> I mean, there still are remnants of that p- punk scene, you know, but, yeah, but it's where? Not, I didn't see it, man. It's not what it was. I know? didn't see it. Yeah, there's I a few venues. See I didn't believe me. I was looking. I was like, man, fucking bad brains for me. What the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing. I did not know. I felt like the misfit, man. Yeah, it's uh, it's different for sure. Yeah. The other uh, debates when you had the Clinton book. Oh, that, that was, was wild. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> the Democratic primary in was, Charleston, South yeah. Carolina. I was walking around with the book The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander <laughs> about <laughs> mass incarceration. And I was just like... Hi, I'm here in Charleston, South Carolina, trying to find out why do black people still like Hillary Clinton? Oh, I remember that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Um, that Killer was Mike, like Killer Mike laid it down. Yeah, he, yeah, yeah. yeah. Killer Mike. The only one that laid. Yeah, it. he was good. Yeah. Yeah, Killer Mike did not mince his words. He did lay it down. I love him, man. He's brilliant. He's, he's so, so good. Yeah, he's, he's so, so good. He's so too. good. He's so brilliant and he's so talented and uh, yeah. I uh, that was the one. That was the one time I was like, I was like. I really want to know if he saw this. So, like, I, I tweeted at him a couple times about it, and then I didn't hear anything back. And then I'm sure he did. I know, but then I made sure to know that he did. Cause <laughs> I, I needed to know. He's fucking killer Mike. I needed to. Like, I'm, I was the only one I cared about, like, if somebody saw the work, right? So I was like, I just sent out a message right before I went to bed. I was like, hey, does anybody out there know at Killer you, you Mike? You never hear nothing? And then I was like, I just wanted to know it. And then I sent that, and then I woke up the next day, and it saw it. He said, uh, saw it, loved it. Like, that was it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that sounds about right. That sounds cool. Mm-hmm. That's all yeah. I needed. You know what yeah. I mean? But, uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was a cool one. Interesting. It was interesting at that one how people did feel really uncomfortable. Like, uh, But what the fuck? Why? It's, it's true. Yeah, it's, all true, it's true. And it's like, wh- you should feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Interesting. So, Simone Sanders, who uh, was... Uh, not related to Bernie Sanders, but Bernie Sanders' press secretary, uh, like super talented press secretary, like political pundit. Uh, I remember when I was talking to her about it, even though she was, I was like on camera, even though she was uh, Sanders' press secretary at the time, mm-hmm. she would not go like off script and talk shit about Hillary. They wa- they did not want to create a sort of rift during that primary and stuff like that. Crazy. Um. Yeah. And now I'm pretty sure she's working on the Biden campaign. So I guess she's just like a hired, like yeah. a, she's just like a hired assassin or whatever, political Not operative. Um, but I do remember that, uh, whatever, I'm just going to say this. Hired political operative. Yeah. Some good words right there, <laughs> yeah, buddy. Dude, yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, there, I won't, uh, all right, why not? So this, <laughs> this is, I like the sound of this already. <laughs> Okay, so you guys know like Triumph the Insult Comic Dog, of course, right? Yes. What's that? I'm Triumph sorry, the Insult Comic Dog from yes. the Conan yeah. show. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that <clears throat> dude, his his team's like all their like equipment didn't get in on time, but then it did, right? But because it wasn't going to be in on time, they asked if we could they could use our stuff, and we agreed. And then they ended up being able to use their own stuff. Uh, but the producer promised me that I could do a segment with Triumph for my package, right? And I was like, oh, that would be cool. And so I'm doing the interview with the dude, with him, and like uh, Triumph Theater's called Comedy Dog is like, oh, the new Jim Crow is like, uh, come for the, uh, you know, come for the Cornell West introduction, stay for the mass incarceration, like little jokes like that. And then he's like, Hillary Clinton, and he's talking about how she's got like a haircut like uh, Siegfried or Roy or whatever, da da da, you know, all that stuff. So I'm just gonna use this couple minutes of it. I get an email the next day from the producer saying, like, hey, uh, from his producer being like, hey, we'd really appreciate if you didn't use any of that stuff. Robert Smigel uh, doesn't want to be part of any uh, Clinton hit piece. 
He didn't want to be in this Whoa. segment. So, of course, I respected it, but it was because he likes the Clintons. So I was like, Jesus, that's kind of weak. But uh, that's weak. don't tell anybody I told you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nobody's listening anyway. <laughs> These aren't even on. <laughs> Someone's going to jump into the tiger pit <laughs> and ruin my career. <laughs> but uh, that was pretty weak, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah that's horrible. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh Lord. Well, they watch out for them. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking right. But this is something interesting. Is so that story that I did. You'll end up dead, dude. What? Yeah, (laughs) Vince Foster, man. No, I don't believe that shit. But uh, yeah, so so that story that I did about New Jim Crow and kind of the Clinton connection to mass incarceration and crime bill and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Which, by the way, Joe Biden wrote it. Okay, he wrote it. I know. Nobody. (laughs) And has not even been repentant. Like even the Clintons, at least were like, yeah, he doesn't even give a fuck. They mention it all the time. He's like, yep. Yeah, yeah. But interestingly, it was the '90s. It was the '90s. We all, were, everybody was doing it. But uh, <laughs> crazy. It doesn't seem like the '90s set the tone. It honestly doesn't even seem like black people care. I know. What the <laughs> fuck? What is up with him getting that whole like Southern black vote? I don't understand yeah, what don't is know. happening, I don't man. Know. Maybe it's because it's like the Obama connection. You know, he's that's Obama's totally what VP. it is. That's, that's totally what, what it is. is. But still, that's so like. I know it's myopic. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> so anyway, so that story, right? I didn't think about this so well after the fact. There's this, uh, there's this really great. Uh, she's a, she's a professor and she also writes a lot about political satire. Her name's Sophia McLennan and she writes like a, a lot of articles and stuff for Salon. She's always analyzing political satire and she really kind of keeps track of all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, she's written like an entire book on Stephen Colbert. She wrote a book about the sort of the Egyptian qu- equivalent to John Stewart. That guy, Egyptian equivalent to John Stewart. Yeah, there was a guy. I forget his name. He's pretty famous, but he then he ended up having it like, it was, he stayed on the air like as the kind of Arab Spring stuff was happening, and it was like very mm, risky. Oh, okay. and his life is threatened. All this sort of stuff. Um, and he's got a pretty crazy story. But she wrote mm. a book about him. But um, anyway, so she's uh, been a fan of uh, of Redacted Tonight. She's coming some taping. She's writing some nice articles about the the show, and so. One time when we were hanging out in D.C., she was like, she's like, you know, you broke that story for the election cycle. She's like, you did that piece. It got enough amplification. Then uh, the Young Turks decided to pick it up and they did something about that story. And then Michelle Alexander soon after wrote a piece in The Nation about that. She's like, but your thing was the first time around that that... um, that that kind of got moving and then it kept getting amplified by those those, you know, those bigger outlets and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, holy shit, that's crazy. You know what I mean? And yeah. then if I want to extrapolate it even further, uh, you know, Hillary Clinton lost only won like 88% of the black vote instead of 92. And if she won that 92, maybe she would have won the election. So that was enough to kind of sway it in that direction. And RT America, where I work, is funded by the Russian government. So I guess there was Russian meddling. And I guess at the end of the day, I'm the reason that Trump won the election. I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's something for the. Uh, <laughs> did you get a plaque for it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Danny, that was the worst time for you to get up. I was just doing a whole long thing, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, that was just me. That was me being facetious and grandiose about like a political <laughs> satire thing. But uh, it is kind of wild that I didn't realize that that was the first time that election cycle. And the way that I came up with that idea is that, that me and the woman I was dating at the time, we were like, we we're hanging out in DC and we were trying to figure out what the angle would be and we started reading through that book and just kind of figured it out and that was that was the satirical angle that we decided to take okay it's pretty oh, crazy so Danny just locked himself out of the barbershop <laughs> his pizza came and destroyed the whole <laughs> Jesus Christ <laughs> real professional outfit huh? that was yeah. the so worst. I had to order some food no too, it's man. fine do your thing <laughs> but that was the day. worst uh, time I was I was spinning up my whole weird yarn there no, I'm good. Oh, Thank you. I'm, I'm, good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I've been vegan for almost two years. I apologize. No, I don't know. I'm, I'm good for right now. Eat it. Eat it. Uh, and I will tell you the thing that I probably will end up maybe once a month just like treating myself is got to be a slice of New York pizza. That's the one thing. That's the thing that in D.C. it wasn't a problem because D.C. pizza sucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just avoid it. That's the one good thing about DC. The pizza sucks. <laughs> but uh, but that New York pizza, that's the thing that's fucked up. What was your uh, 
Like, what was your springboard into comedy? Well, I always wanted to do it. Like, I mean, I've been, I've been in stand-up comedy for 19 years. That's so crazy. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but uh, I, uh, I, when I was when I was young, I always just loved the way that it felt to make people laugh. Like, I always knew I liked that. And so then I realized then too, like later in life, when life starts to kind of kick you in the teeth and you have to deal with like some, you know, mm -hmm. some pain and adversity and things like that, I found that being able to talk about that stuff and be funny about it was really therapeutic. So like those two things together, I was like, this is it for me. Mm -hmm. um, How did you cross the, the threat? Like, this is a bad example, but people are like, oh, you know, like I'm funny, but I don't think I could get up and make a room of people laugh. You know, like how did you cross that? Well, it's it's definitely a learn by doing thing. You, you just know? go out like, and fall on your face and yeah, I learn think so. To... I think so. But I think you also you have to somewhere inside have some sort of fucked up confidence in yourself <laughs> that you think you can do this thing. You but know what I mean? Fire burning. Like no matter how much you suck at times, or you know that you're like, oh no, I know that I can do this thing. Um, but I I believe it or not, the first time I did stand up, I was I was in Jamaica. I was on vacation. In Jamaica? Yeah. That's the first time you did stand-up. With my mother and my brother. I was in seventh grade. Tough crowd? Well, you know. No, I did well. This is what it was. I was at a re I was at this, like, Club Caribbean. It was like a two-star resort. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I remember that. It wasn't very... It was like a timeshare type Holy place. Man. I was in seventh grade. Seventh grade? Yes. Yes. I'm not joking. Oh, so, man. I was... So, basically, we were saying these little, like, kind of, like, I don't know, they were sort of felt like huts with these like thatched roofs and like these like little air conditioning units in them. And there was sort of like a there was a pool and there was sort of a resort area and some tennis courts. And Sounds great. I thought it was nice. And uh, but it was mostly Europeans staying there because it was like not what like, I guess, I don't know, Americans that want fancy hotels or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So we were there and. There was a, uh, I, I made, I made friends with this, this kid, Brandon. He was like, uh, this Canadian kid that was about my age. And then his father was hanging out. And then there was this, there was an 18 year old kid from New York named Pat who didn't really have anybody to hang out with because they were either older or younger. So he would kind of hang out with us. And there was a talent show at the end of the week. And it was like kind of decided that I was going to do stand up at it because I kind of wanted to do it. I think I always wanted to do comedy. And so this yeah, nothing written. No, nothing written. This kid Pat and my friend Brandon and his father wrote the material for me. And uh it was really bad material. <laughs> like I can only remember a couple of the jokes, but they were like, I would never say this stuff. <laughs> I remember during the day I was like nervous trying to like like rehearse it and memorize it and everything like that. But then when it came time for the talent show, I performed it and I won the talent show and the prize was a bottle of rum. But they nice. wouldn't give it to me because I was only like 12 years old or 13 years old. And it's the, the first and last time anyone has ever written material for me. And then I didn't do stand-up again until I was like 19. <laughs> and like after the freshman year of college. But I will say that it's like it's a learn by doing sort of thing. You know, a lot of times people tell the story that or sometimes you'll hear from comedians that the first time they perform it went really well. And then the hundred times after that, it did not. It's like being in a band. <laughs> exactly. Dude, yeah. The first time I played drums live, it was fucking fantastic. Yep. I was like 12. Yep. And then I spent the next few years being like, yeah, you know. Yeah, like, totally. I mean, I've done shows where, because I'm in a band with Bill. I sing and play rhythm guitar in the band with him. I've had shows years ago where fucking amazing. I've had shows after that, where I sound like I just fucking started. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. When you're loose and you're first doing it, the reason it goes off without a hitch is because you don't give a fuck. You're yeah, just right. like mm -hmm. doing shit. But once you start to focus on the mechanics of it, you get into the minutia of it and that gets in your head just a little bit. You're learning that it's more than just getting up there and talking some shit or just getting up there and banging something out and, yeah. and deliver it in a certain way. I got a lot of respect for Stan. I, couldn't, I could not do it. You don't think so? You got a good no. personality. You got a career charismatic guy. <laughs> Thank you very much, man. <laughs> but it's about it's about writing the bits though, and like actually going up there and like yeah, you know what I mean. Like I can be funny in a one on one or like not even one on one, but just like in a conversation or social conversation mm -hmm. exactly yeah. socially. Yeah. Well, that's where it started for me, like being like, oh, I growing up, I'm being conversationally funny. I'm enjoying that, and then yeah, and and then you just sort of figure, I just you sort of figure it out by doing it. I uh, I don't know. For me, at this point. 
it's about wanting to put together a body of work and put together like a new a new act that now for me is really I'm not writing like a, a one man show, but I am writing essentially an hour that is about what I've been through with bipolar disorder and talking about mental health. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to make a really interesting, funny hour about that. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's kind of uh, maybe to making it even a little bit more challenging mm-hmm. uh, because <clears throat> even if this stuff is funny to me, for me to be able to convey it to other people to have it be funny can be kind of challenging and to also make sure people realize that like, and not think I'm just making some of this shit up. So there's there's a number of ins and outs that I'm trying to work on. But it's uh, when it's clicking, it is it's for me. It feels like what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to go see one of the shows that you do at Cobra Club. Yeah, yeah, you should. Is that where you're performing regularly? Yeah, every Friday at Cobra. Every every Friday. Every Friday, nine o'clock at Cobra Club. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh damn. So I run it with some there. friends. We gotta get over there. One of the Fridays that I'm in town, we'll go over there. I'm down. Check it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's fun. We I run it with some friends, so we kind of we kind of rotate who ha- hosts and who does sets. But I'm mm-hmm. I'll always at least be hosting or doing a set. So I'll how many people you guys have uh, come up? Uh, we we usually book uh, four to five other acts, and we get like it's pretty cool because it's this sort of it's this really fun room and fun crowd, and we're friends with all these great comics. We get all these comedians that you'd see, you know, from. Comedy Central, Colbert, HBO, like all the best comics roll through. So it's oh, wow, kind of cool. this like hidden gem of like word of a mouth sort of show. Like, yeah, uh, yeah live from outer space dot com. You can get tickets in advance, even though it's complimentary. We recommend that you save your seats. So, yeah. Oh, it's seats. It's like seats. no, well it's, well, it's seats and standing. But I yeah, mean, yeah. we uh, yeah, you could just go to live from outer space dot com to get all the info. Mm-hmm. I still got to watch the special. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I want to. <clears throat> Yeah, that's. Uh, I've seen some some clips, a trailer. Oh, cool! Yeah. Thanks for checking that out. But yeah. I wanna I wanna rent it and uh, or buy it. Yeah, I'll give you the promo code if you want. Hey right, right, man, man. nice. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Every of those promo codes. Um, one of Even the, business I'll, I'll owner friends of yours no, who could probably it. spend six bucks to I'll buy, and support buy it. five years of your friend's work. It's fine. <laughs> I'll buy it. Thanks, man. No, I'm dying to check it out, though. <laughs> one of the things I saw that I thought was really interesting was when you were talking about you know the manic episodes and, and like yeah. you said you kind of dipped out for a little bit. And then when you came back, your friend set it up for you as a roast. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that that was that was uh, that was years ago. So, I had a really uh, extreme extended episode back in two thousand eight. That was really like basically before that, I'd been establishing myself in New York as a comedian for a few years, and before that, I was I was in I was still in Michigan and I was in school, and I remember thinking like, okay. If I ha- after I'm est- trying to establish myself in New York and this very difficult thing I'm trying to do to make it as a comedian, I one of the biggest nightmares in my life would be like if I had an episode and sort of like exposed that aspect of myself and burned things to the ground like that and burned all those bridges and then it fucking happened. You were always paranoid about that. Well, I was worried, I was scared about it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and uh, it happened. It fucking happened. I had a really very public, extreme episode that was really extended through a, a good portion of. 2008 and then I had to go away for a while and kind of recuperate and I didn't come back into the scene until like the fall of 2009 or so and um and because I'd always been so kind to people over the years I'd built up a lot of goodwill so people weren't like begrudgingly having me back they were like you know happy to see me around and stuff like Mm -hmm. that so I was able to rebuild stuff but I also realized that I wasn't going to be able to, you know, brush one speck of dirt underneath the carpet. I had to like address this stuff on stage yeah, head yeah. on. And it actually did really force me to become a better comedian because I had to figure out how to make this really personal stuff Attack funny. It. Like I didn't I wouldn't say that I was like, you know, tragically unfunny before that, but the comedian that I became after that uh right. from before is better. Yeah, you, you know? embraced it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's really cool how like you're how you made it part of it and like you're talking about it out in the open. You're not like, you know, you're saying out loud, you know, I had this episode and whatever, and you're taking it on and you're just vocal about it, really, you know, and just, I'm just, just trying into it. Yeah. I'm just trying to, I'm know? just trying, 
And that's really important, I think, to be able to do that for your own for your own healing. Yeah, and I as think well so. as other people to yeah. hear you be you know be confident I hope so. you're, because you're you confident know? in it too. Yeah. Like it happened. You acknowledge it happened. You you bounce back from it, and you're like, this is what it is. You're not going to ignore that it happened. Yeah. You're vocal about it, and that helps other people. I think. I hope so. I mean, I got this was cool. And this, this is a bit in the special. I got an email from this woman, Haley, this college student, and she said that she I was her favorite comedian, and that she's really happy that she found out about me from her abnormal psych professor. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh man, <laughs> this at this psych professor at Old Dominion University in Virginia plays an audio clip of my no. stand up. I swear to God, during his lecture on mood disorders, and she said it's the first time in her life she could laugh at mania and psychosis instead of cry and feel bad about herself. Wow. Yeah. So that, of course, means a lot to me. But I also turned that into like a four and a half minute bit because I'm like, yeah, like I'm appreciative of that, but also horrified at the same time. It's like my stand up is being used as a pathological case study in an abnormal psych class in a college. So it's like shit like that. But uh, so, yes. So when I came back to that scene uh, in late 2009, I kind of slowly was kind of reingratiating myself into the scene and doing stuff and doing shows. But like the one place that really was... And a lot of ways still is, is like, uh, you know, a real kind of comedy home base for me. This venue in, in Long Island City, Queens called The Creek and the Cave um, that me and my friends, we actually started that venue uh, back in the day. Like there were no shows there. And then it eventually became an entire comedy venue. Um, wow. Yeah. And uh, so I ended up getting 86 from there. You know, I got kicked out of there and, and really strained things with uh, with my friend Rebecca, the owner. And that just like was horrifying to me and humiliating to me. So I wouldn't go back around there. I had trouble figuring out how to interact with her. And so it was just sort of the community decided. They're like, yeah, it'll be the first time you go back to the creek in the cave, we're going to throw a roast of you and we're going to tear you a new asshole. So like I didn't have to like limp back in there and like uh you know in like a real kind of true spirit of stand-up comedy and that subculture yeah, it's good homecoming they fucking tore me a new one and it was a really fun night who and better than your friends right? yeah 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 that's so great man that's that awesome. still gives me fucking chills you know yeah. it was it was fun it was it was a really fun <laughs> night yeah 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 so that was cool um but i do remember a couple of years later when one of my really good buddies and <clears throat> truly what like you know one of my uh, favorite comedians sean Patton, he was getting roasted there and he didn't want the roast to happen, but they were doing it or whatever. But he somehow kind of made the roast about me. And I remember this one because he told everybody, he's like, all right, I'll do this roast. But the only way I'll do it is if everybody that's on the day is roasting. It's like no one, because I was part of the roasters too. He was like, nobody say anything about John the entire time. Like he'll lose his fucking mind. Like if like no one say any jokes, like doesn't, doesn't acknowledge or like bring me up. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like he knew I wouldn't be able to handle that. And so like, People in the audience knew that it was a thing. Like all the other roasters knew it was a thing to like not write any jokes about me. And so I knew that that was happening, even though in the middle, and I couldn't help myself. I still, I was like, if somebody doesn't say something about me, I'm gonna <laughs> lose my mouth. And they were just like, what are you talking about? Relax, man. <laughs> and then they let me go up in the end. And but then like no one laughed. It like made me bomb. So like, he like like <laughs> socially engineered his roast against me. Which I remember more about that one. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But uh yeah. Um oh, man. But that's what's cool. That's why that's why the roasting thing for so many years, I liked how it was always something that was reserved for comedians in the comedy community. You know, it became this different thing when it started becoming like these roasting of celebrities. You know, that it kind of like yeah, it's fun and it's entertaining, but yeah. it's kind of like that's not really the spirit, essentially, of what it was supposed to be. Yeah, you do be. that amongst your friends, sitting yeah. around a I was going to say, I was yeah. just about like, to say, I get roasted every time I hang out with my friends. Yeah, exactly. Dude, we, Josh, we roast the ones we he's love. He's the biggest you know? one. Josh called me the Polish Chow Young Fat. <laughs> I was like, that's fucking brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, this guy, the, that the, like our friend that we're talking ago. about, he's amazing. And he roasted me really one time really bad. He called me Big Chief Littlefoot. Uh, I wanted to kill this motherfucker when he said that. I was like, that is probably the best joke anyone can ever say about me. I, was like, I couldn't even be mad, but I was mad. I was like, I'm going to fucking kill you, motherfucker. <laughs> He's going to hear this shit right now and probably start laughing He's his, ass, laughing off. his <laughs> ass off. Right that's hilarious. That is the best, that's the best roast I ever got. That's good. <laughs> that's good. 
I'll tell you though, the whole roast scene, like I, I like watching those videos because like roast culture and stand up is this pretty big thing now where there's all these roast battle shows all the time. And I like it's weird. I have a weird sort of uh, relationship with that where I genuinely like watching people do it, but I have no desire to sort of write jokes like that or to be involved in a roast like that. I just I don't I, it doesn't it's not my cup of tea. But I do find it incredibly entertaining. I don't know. Why, why is it not your cup of tea? Like, just because you're, like, ripping on somebody? It's not your style? I guess it's not. I guess it's not my style. I guess that I could... I know that I could I could handle it happening to me and even find it enjoyable, mm-hmm. but I don't really you need... You don't find any... I don't really need it. <laughs> I don't really, <laughs> I don't I don't need, that really that need that to happen right now. <laughs> and I think also the... Uh, Putting a lot of creative energy towards that compared to what I'm trying to write you is sure. sort of different. Of course. You know? But I do think that it is funny. Also, I don't know if it's actually necessarily my strength to be able to write mm. jokes like that. About people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. To touch on that point was um it was the William Shatner roast and Patrice O'Neill gets up at the end. Patrice is, was a you know, a uniquely brilliant comedian. You know, there's really I mean, he really is a class unto his own. You yeah. Know? I got to meet him a couple of times, which was cool. I hung out with him a little bit. Um, I'd be afraid like, to hang out with him. Yeah, seriously. No. I'd just be waiting. Oh shit, that shit's gonna turn my way at a certain point. <laughs> he's nice. And he's <laughs> nice. He's always nice. <laughs> Our few interactions, he was always nice to me. Like uh, one time, he was re- he was trying to figure out how long his uh, set was uh, to record before the HBO special. So he was like recording. He was just taping sets or just doing sets in the city at the Boston Comedy Club, which used to be around the block from the Comedy Cellar. Uh, I used to bark and hand out flyers there for stage time when he was doing that. So I just happened to time him one time and I was like, oh, that was this long. He's like, oh, thanks. Here's 20 bucks. I was like, no, he's like, no, here's 20 bucks. I was like, all right, thanks. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's not. But uh, he was always just, he was always cool to me the few times we hung out, you know. But he said something so funny on, uh, on Opie and Anthony. He goes, he goes there's things you got to know about white people. There's, there's things you just don't know about, like, about white people and you find them out. It's like, White men are deeply affected by the song Creep by Radiohead. <laughs> He's like, you don't know that. He's like, but they really are. And they're like, I'm a creep. He's like, they all identify as being creeps or something. I just thought that was so funny. because there's, there's something so bizarrely true about that. You know what I mean? My, who are some of your... Um, some comics I really like? Yeah. Uh, let's see. In no particular order, I uh, I always think uh, Patton Oswalt's really great. Um, uh, Maria Bamford, I have a strong affinity for her. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Kyle Kinane, hilarious dude. Um, Hannibal Burris. Oh, he's I love him, dude. Hannibal makes me laugh so much. Uh, he was asking me some comics I like, and so I named a few. And then, oh, Hannibal! Yeah. I was bummed about his podcast though, because he he just stopped doing it. He just kind of got just, lazy yeah, with it. Yeah, he just got busy or whatever yeah. happened. And then, oh, really? But his podcast was really, really funny. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I thought it was good. But yeah, I uh, Hannibal. Me and him both moved to the New York around the same time. I moved from uh, like Ann Arbor, outside of Detroit scene, and he moved from Chicago. And uh, wait, you lived in. So I went Michigan? to school. Yeah. Oh. So I start the first shows I did were mics, open mics in New York, but I started uh in Ann Arbor and kind of like around the kind of uh Detroit metropolitan area. Oh okay. uh, as fuck up there. Yeah, it is. It is. <clears throat> um so I did about three and a half years there before I moved to New York. Um but yeah, but me and Hannibal moved around the same time and so we were doing mics together and stuff like that. And uh it's good to know that our careers sort of took similar trajectories. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I mean, he's great. He's Oops. such a weird dude. He's so funny, dude. I mean, well, he's responsible for the Bill Cosby joke that that's yes, crazy. I know. It's Isn't amazing. It ignited it. Dude, that's what I always thought when people so were like, insane. it's the Hollywood machine trying to bring down. No. And it's like, no, no. it's Hannibal Burris no, who Hannibal Hannibal made the yeah. first joke about it. Isn't that well, crazy? Just, these rumors are around. People knew this shit for yeah, a long yeah. time. He but just ignited interest, like he sparked like a. Uh, yeah. It just, it was like he was amplified enough that when he did it, that's what happened. You yeah, know, he was yeah. around for hashtags. Yeah. Hashtags weren't around yeah. before that. Yeah. <laughs> people but, start uh, looking into shit and they're like, oh, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Didn't have Google. It's It's crazy. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Hannibal used to run the, uh, the Sunday night show at Knitting Factory, uh, for years when he was in town and I would always go do that show 
um, and you know, he's he's a buddy. I, just, I, I we haven't connected in a while, but uh, but yeah, he's he's so funny. He just always makes me laugh so much, you know. And you guys know Eric Andre? Yes. yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Eric's hilarious. He's my first roommate in New York. Oh, really? He's wild. <laughs> he is. He is. But you know what's interesting? Like, he is like a totally wild dude, but he that dude meditates every day. You know what I mean? He, oh, like, yeah. Yeah, he lives very healthily. You know, he's uh, he's got a good balance. Huh. You know? Yeah, Sorry. I want to start going out to some more shows, man. It's a cool subculture in the city, you know. Uh, it's fun. I'm here four. I'm here four days a week now. Okay. I know. I trimmed it down from seven to four. I'm still. I still live here. <laughs> this is true. This is true. Where else are you at? Massachusetts. Yeah, you got like a whole spread out there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good for you. That's yes. Great. That's hey, cool. Hey, 26 years here, man. I'm proud of you, man. I'm I need. I, you, you know, I, I paid my dues. Yeah. New York will kill you. Yeah, I just got back. It's fucking killing. <laughs> it is killing me. You ready to die? I'm right, I'm right. I got a death wish. I'm back. <laughs> Seriously, man, I feel like I'm like rejuvenating myself by not being here three days a week. My friend Stu moved back to Maine, got a house and all this stuff, and he was down here. I was talking to him, and I was like, "How you like in Maine, man?" And he goes, "My life has improved exponentially every single day since I, I have bet. left New York." I wow. bet. And it's, I was like, "I I don't need to hear. That's the wrong thing I to mean, say." To but you know it's living. true. <laughs> you know it's true, man. I mean, dude. Like, no, there's no other life out the, there the aside first, from this trash can. When I first started doing that, <clears throat> I came back. I took like two weeks off. I wasn't here for like two or three weeks, and I came back. The first thing I noticed was all the dog shit everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, man, <laughs> has this always been here? I, I went on Facebook a couple of days ago <laughs> and, um, oh, here's your memory from like five years ago. And yeah. I put something up. I was like, oh, it's great to see that we're getting nice weather and the snow is melting, which is exposing the Brooklyn dog shit apocalypse uh-huh. that every single sidewalk <laughs> is. You know? It's true. It's true. And then I thought about it this year and we hadn't had any snow. So nobody's just letting them hide. No, isn't yeah, that bizarre? Yeah, yeah. Isn't that bizarre that we haven't had any snow? It was a very it's mild so winter. It's so crazy, man. Last yeah. year was the same, but this year was worse. Yeah. yeah like, yeah, yeah. what's happening, man? Like, it's not right. Mm. I haven't shoveled in two years. Mm. I got a business and a house I need to shovel outside of. I got, like, 10 pounds of rock salt in that closet right there. Okay? Just like, hanging out. What is happening, man? It's not right. Maybe, it's not- maybe... Maybe all all the scientists aren't conspiring. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Against us. Like, you know what? Next year, we'll see what that's like, man. And right. if that shit is the same or even worse, we got some fucking real problems, man. But what are we gonna do? I mean, it's we can't do shit. Like, what? We can't do shit. I know. I mean, I don't think, I don't think society is willing, even if willing, able to. It'd be a complete flip over. We'd to, have to like change everything. It'd have to become like priority numero uno. Yes. Every day. Like, all the time. Like all the time. Mm-hmm. And people ain't ready for that. They're not ready to accept that we're just bacteria with a soul. Bacteria <laughs> with a soul. Whoa. You guys, this would be the name of your guys' next album. You know? right? <laughs> I got that it's true, though. Ah. It is true, though. I mean, we are like yeah. fungi, right? It's like, we are. Like a cancer, really. But that's the thing. That would, that's like what I guess that's what the uh, the best case scenario, like uh, implementation of the Green New Deal would be. It'd be like, OK, you know how there was like the New Deal under FDR, which is like this huge social mm-hmm. program mm-hmm. to employ people. Stuff. Mm-hmm. So the Green New Deal that. I guess like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and Bernie Sanders, and even before that, mm-hmm. the Green Party proposed some years back, which is so hilarious to I me know. that they did that, and everybody's like, "No, we, I know. we still don't like you." And they but, were on it, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Jesus yeah, exactly. Christ! And they're using the same name too. I know. They just totally I know. stole it. No <laughs> credit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and all the liberal people hate the Green Party too. Like, okay, all right. The Green yeah. Party, the people who know better. Yeah, <laughs> you're sorry for yeah. all the research. Where's the My research? God. Yeah. But I guess that is like, okay, a, you know, a massive undertaking where it is to create a sustainable, you know, a sustainable uh, economy within, I don't know, 12 years, 10 years, some crazy thing like that. So it's yeah. like, it would have to be this, or maybe it's 30 years, I don't know. But it, it would have, have to be to mandated be, by law, I feel like, to really like flip it over. Yeah, but there's too much of, there's too much, not enough, there's not enough consensus in to the give country. Yeah. 
Or half the country doesn't even think it's real. I know. It's so. I mean, they're not going to. They're not going to convince. You know. Yeah, they're going to wait until it's until. I mean, how much we have the storms that we have. That's the craziest part. Like we're not getting snow where we're supposed to get, but we're getting like crazy hurricanes where we're not supposed to get them. We're getting tornadoes and earthquakes right. and like. What the fuck? See, yeah. but I think that just goes back to people are just going to understand what's in their own neighborhood. Yes, you know, because it's true. when you really think true. about it, you're like, I, you know, I might sound like an asshole, but like New York and L.A. are completely out of touch with what's going on in the rest of the country. A hundred percent. And the rest of the country, like, like New York City, it's its own right. country, and L.A. is its own country. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, yeah. people aren't willing to just take a little step back from their own favorite point of view to even try and understand. Somebody like, oh, okay, I can understand why somebody in mm-hmm. Missouri might think that. To know? empathize at least. Yeah, because they're not they're not dealing with we're a world city. We deal with everything. Yeah. Well, do you feel like you it's know? schooling in general is outdated? Like what you learn in school as a young kid right now, you're not learning how all these things are connected anymore, I feel like. I don't know. i that's what I feel like. I feel like it's like I think it's teaching the social these... media bubble bubble also. Well that too, that but I'm saying like from from own. a very foundational perspective, I think like what if they're not teaching young kids mm. how all these things are connected? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like nobody's learning that. They're just they're they're um, what do you call it? They're distracted by social media. You know what I'm saying? They're in their own bubble. I think it's time maybe we just kind of do a real overhaul. People have to be like, okay, I'm going to vote for this guy because I like him. I'm still not going to get everything I want. No, that's not, how the that's not works. happening. Yeah, but yeah. that's how people are. I know it's They're crazy. Like, I wanted like this one. I pin everything onto this guy, and like, okay, say Bernie does get elected. Like, hopefully he does. Yeah. Right. It's going to be years before he does something. It's sure. Gonna be able well, when people are six like years before something gets done. When people were telling me like, why you why are you going to support Bernie? You're crazy. Like, you see his list of shit. You see his laundry list. He's never going to get that done. I'm like. I don't think he wants to get all that done. I think if he gets two of those things done, it's a different country. <laughs> yeah, you just start pushing things in that direction. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? You just we start... do two things. It's but a different place. Want instant now. Just start, and yeah, they just every and they're looking the at the Titanic face value. around the other way a little. That bit. long laundry list. Oh, that's impossible. You can never do that. Well, let's do two things, man. Right. You know, yeah. like the best compromise is when nobody's happy. I think you're right. I think it's hard for people, especially with this climate issue, to see outside of our own sort of world and our lens, right? Like, like I know how awful things have been in say Australia and mm-hmm. Puerto Rico oh and God. stuff like that. And it's viscerally awful and I can, but it's not affecting us. It's not affecting us. So it's like, even though it, I, I guess it's, it's, I just use the word viscerally, but it's not viscerally affecting me. No, it's like, well, it's like, yeah, I can donate. If we didn't money see it on them. the media all the time and be bombarded on social media with news and all these things. We wouldn't even really feel that much because we wouldn't see it. Yeah, but even with that, if we only had to rely on like seven o'clock news, like you know, back in the old days when we were younger, yeah, yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like we would never even know. That is because they were posting pictures of koalas. Yes, being yeah, safe, sure. and everybody was like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. we respond to that. And then, sure, you know, that's what you respond to, and then you. Might take the initiative to go past that. Uh-huh. Yeah, but you, yeah, but you, you'll take the initiative to go past that to like you know, post about it or to donate some money or something like that. But you're not going to take the step beyond that and be like, oh, I'm going to drastically change my life to like right. decrease my carbon footprint because mm. of this. I don't think that it. I don't know if I don't know if that necessarily jolts people into action or not. Well, but I'm asking. People aren't really that prone to give up convenience i don't i'm never preach about it. i just do my own little thing like i i always just keep a canvas bag in my pocket really right there that's look at it. you you got a trash bag you walk around with a trash bag it's not a trash bag look it's a oh, nice I thought yellow that was like a personal no, that's trash not. bag <laughs> this is a You're like this is my trash is going in here no this is a yellow this is so i don't use plastic bags at the grocery store you just that's all you buy for groceries well, no i mean if i'm well they I charge go to a grocery for plastic store, bags well, if I go to a grocery store, if I'm going properly going grocery store. Oh, that's shopping, like your bodega bag. This is my bodega bag. Uh-huh. Yeah. And I just use it. Big deal. I follow you. And then I just get used to it. Yeah. No, my my, my trunk has those bags as well. But it's, that's what uh, yeah. that's what Claudia uses when she goes to the grocery store. And it's not, she makes I mean, her own bags and stuff. Yeah. It's just a little thing. But uh the uh yeah. No, it's good. That's that I mean that's good. Plastic bags, fuck plastic bags, right? But the thing is, uh I think that this new 
tax that they put on in the city, I, I'm kind of cynical. Now there's a five. There's five cents on plastic oh, bags. Oh, plastic yeah. bag, yeah. I, I'm a little cynical People on this People don't give one. a fuck about that. Exactly. Okay. That's it why. It used to be like 25 cents. Yeah, they're like, That's exactly what I was going to say. I think yeah. if they really cared, they would put 25 cents yeah. on, and then people would do it. I think five cents Fuck it, put is a enough. dollar. Yeah, exactly. Everybody, everybody will stop. Exactly. I think the reason they did five is because they know people will just pay, and they can just collect it as a new revenue source. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And I think it's kind of lame. It's kind of cynical. No, that, five cents is nothing. But yeah, like if it was a little bit more, it'd be worth it. Yeah, five cents is like okay. People are still going to buy. Yeah, them. nobody gets a fuck. Five cents. Years break. ago now, years and years ago now, when they did this in Ireland, whatever they decided to charge, whether it was five cents or twenty five cents, whatever it was, it really worked. Like within a couple of weeks, like plastic bag usage dropped by like over ninety percent. Mm -hmm. Irish people just took to it really quickly. Yeah, with of the course. Bags. Americans don't give a fuck. No, <laughs> they don't. It's too disposable here. Yeah. Everything just and it's also seen as money too. Like, ah, it's also cents, seen as on. almost like you're lame or you're like annoying or you're like self righteous. If you're like, oh, you should use a canvas bag, people are like, oh, God, what, what, who do you think you are? It's like I okay, just don't. Fuck, I, don't that's real, I mean, you always put it in your pocket. That's good. I just that's my problem. Like I don't, I'm not gonna have it I, carrying it with me. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm gonna be out for the day, that's why I bring. This thing. Yeah, you know, I'm not a bag. Like, you know what? That's what it is. I'm not a bag person. I carry, like, I don't carry don't anything carry on me. Bag. I'm just like, I try to be as streamlined well, how about this? as possible. When you got a jacket, you when your jacket, you can always have one in a pocket in a jacket for I that guess. time of the year. True. Look at this. is not, you find this is, this one's. Yeah, my yeah. pocket's usually full, yeah. man. Ones that, like, fold up. Well, Dan, I guess you're <laughs> fucked. I guess, <laughs> <laughs> I guess they're. <laughs> You feel my pain, okay? I do. I got it. I got it. Danny needs to be streamlined. Mi país is tu país, okay? Yes, sí. Mi país. Esta país es lo más país de un país. Un país con mucho problema. Well, Danny needs yeah. to be streamlined. Dude. That's right. I run fast. It's very aerodynamic. <laughs> and you were talking about Ireland. You spent some time over there doing some... Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should do a show together. Sure. How would that... <laughs> well, how would, I would love I to. I like the idea of music and comedy being mixed. Yeah, sure. I'd love to. I will tell you this: uh, it can be. Call my agent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, my agent. Has, I will tell you this. My, call agent, my agent has. Uh, I've listened to your band. You guys suck. Yeah. I would never do a show with you. <laughs> All right, relax. I was gonna say, my agent surprisingly has the same phone number as me. But, uh, <laughs> same cell phone and address. Oh, right, whatever, but, uh, but uh, number one, number two. He has no name though. Yeah. No name. Reach no name, through no social name. media. No at my hand. Hello. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's not. Hello. Hello, yes, John. I said you're interested in performing with him. Who's calling? You do music, yes. <laughs> um, you sound a lot like him. <laughs> but uh, I was going to say though that music and comedy sometimes is challenging. Like if people don't know that the comedy thing is happening, and there's mm. the music. Like the comedian <laughs> is a real like bummer. No, yeah. I feel like it. It has to be no, no. I feel like right. it should be music after. Yeah, it should be music after. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely that. But even then, it's like people need to know. No, it's like comedy's it's over. Things. It's like when I went to go see uh, Dave Chappelle. Sure. Okay. Excellent set, obviously. Yeah. Did his thing, but then after he was done, it was a concert. Yeah, it has to be promoted. It was like fucking that. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, I guess there's just been times where I've. Where it's been, it has to be promoted that way, right? Because other times where it has I've, to be promoted that way, I knew what I was getting into when I went there. Yeah, because other times I've I've opened for bands, and it's just sometimes it goes well, but sometimes it's been really challenging because the people aren't necessarily expecting. It can't comedy. be. It's it can't be promoted as, and I don't think he did this either. It can't be promoted as like, oh, it's uh, the comedian and this band. It's more of like the comedian is what you're coming for. Stay after. It's like an after party almost. It's not guess, part of yeah, the. Uh, that, that it's not part of it. the production. Yeah, that could be it. You or it can be like really made clear that it's both things and not just like instead of like an not like an opener and band like the comedians not opening and then the band is playing where it's like almost like a co-headlining event. Where it's yeah, like yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I think that would be the sort of thing. Yeah. Speaking of you know how we were talking about the Boston Comedy Club and uh, Patrice and stuff, so around that same time too, that was when. Chappelle was dealing with all that stuff with uh, with Comedy Central, with like the third season oh, of the right, show, right, and right. everybody thought he was like going off the rails and all uh -huh. that stuff, and thought he was down in like South Africa and everything like that. Yeah, what, what, did he go to? Didn't he go to Africa? He went to South Africa, didn't he? 
the, which is funny that he he chose South Africa to go to. I always thought yeah. that was kind of weird. But now he's, I he's always like, thought, he ran to Africa. He went back to Africa. Black man went crazy. He went back to Africa. I'm like, he went to South, South Africa. Africa. Yeah. I'm like, that's not the part of Africa you go to. I think that it came out much later that he actually didn't go down there. That mm-hmm. he just went to like Jersey, where he lives in Ohio or something Jersey. like that. Oh, real? Come on, you, you know, tell me that was all fabricated thing. Well, not that Comedy Central wasn't fucking up and that he kind of was like losing his shit and stuff like that, but I don't know if he actually went to South Africa. Wow. He probably but, went on like a family trip. But now maybe I'm like misremembering. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I'm misremembering. Maybe he did act really go. But what I do know is that when he was bouncing around the city around that time, the only club that he would perform at mm-hmm. was the Boston Comedy Club where I was barking and stuff like that. Oh, really? Because okay. that was where he got his... In New York, that's where he got his start. It was oh. like the first club that would put him up. So he would show up and like... I remember at the time, like the club manager, my buddy Dustin, whenever Chappelle would show up, Dustin would go and like buy him a pack of cigarettes, give him a pack of smokes. Dave would go up on stage and perform for like an hour and a half or whatever. And it was this amazing experience because we're just watching Dave Chappelle. And basically it would be during the week and it would be late at night. So the place would be empty, but then we'd be barking. So we just tell people Dave Chappelle's in there and the place would fill up within like 15 minutes. Wow. You know what I mean? And we watch these amazing performances and experiences happen. And what is really funny is after a couple of weeks of this, me and my friends who are, you know, most nights were barking all night for stage time late at night and it's cold, the winter and all that stuff. We're put it, we're paying our dues. We'd see Dave Chappelle walking up the street and we would get like annoyed. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like the idea of being like, oh, great, Dave's here. We're going to get bumped. We're not gonna. We're gonna have to get it to our fucking time. Well, yeah, I mean that's the nature of it. right? I know, but it's just a funny thing after the fact. No, I'm saying it's the nature of it to feel like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, and the comics that I was doing that with at the time, now they're pretty famous. Like Pete Holmes is one of them, who's really well known comic. Yeah, and Nate Bargatze, who's also a really well known comic. Um, So that was our little class coming up then, and. uh, and yeah, we would be really annoyed when Dave Chappelle would <laughs> pop around because <laughs> it would be like, it's just the idea of being a mad at a comedy, le- like having to watch a comedy legend perform like yeah, yeah. this like, really interesting, crucial time in his life. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I, it's amazing. I needed my fucking five minutes. But uh, <laughs> it's funny. It's just, it's just a little funny thing. I also wanted to ask you, um, your TikTok pool videos. <laughs> oh, oh, I was waiting I'm for a, this to come up, actually. I'm a, like, I'm a pool player myself. <laughs> I just started those. I got to stay on top po- of those. Wait, okay. what's up with the... Because of the poo dash L <laughs> That's, that's, that's yeah. just the way that it's spelled. <laughs> I love it. It's so good. Are they fun to watch? No, they're, they're, they're fucking awesome. <laughs> they're so dumb. <laughs> it's the dumbest so, thing I've done. It's but so I can dumb, tell, like, but as it's a pool good. player, I can tell like when you position your, your hand, like this guy knows how to play pool. He's, yeah, I'm going to bank the shot. And they're just completely... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just keep missing. <laughs> I'm like... I got to keep doing them. I got to keep doing them. I, uh, I think it's just... The pool guy. <laughs> he's a guy who's trying to make promotional videos to sell like pool lessons, but he, these are like the fuck-ups of he the should, videos. You know I mean? add some hashtags in there. <laughs> yeah. I got to do something. But uh, he, you saw those. I think, the oh, pool guy needs his, I think the pool guy should have his own IG. Well, look, I don't do enough on my <laughs> IG. I fucking have another one. I, I just got on Instagram literally within the past few months. Really? Yeah, I fucked up. <laughs> I was like, this one's not going to last. <laughs> I don't even know if that's what I thought. I just didn't want to do it. And the then kids now, are doing. Now it's like my friends don't even want to follow me. They're like, I guess. I'm like, thanks a lot. Go to jfodcomedyspecial.com. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You give it, you give it a try. You like, <laughs> you like, hey, this camera, I gotta promote my stuff. <laughs> that was the saddest. Should I have yelled out my address? <laughs> yeah, just, I'm just gonna give you my social security number. <laughs> 952 Flushing, I cut hair. He's like, I'm not getting a haircut from that dude. I tried, I made a really weird one where I tried to lip sync my own stand up bit. <laughs> oh, shit. Because <laughs> they, that's the thing is, people lip sync content. And they right. keep looping it, right? I see that, yeah. Lip so, syncing and dancing, that seems to be the thing, right? It's one of the things. So I've noticed that sometimes like comedians will post a stand-up clip and then people will be lip syncing their stand-up. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that would be cool. So no one did it for mine. But uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I was like, I'm going to do one of my thing. And I did it. And then it, it got like no amplification on TikTok. But <laughs> my friends thought it was weird and liked it on Instagram. So basically, like, I'll put something on TikTok. Oh, and, and it get the, likes on there. And it gets sometimes... One of my pool videos got like 86,000 views on TikTok, but only like 
20 likes and like nobody followed me for I was going to say I would think that the pool guy would do very well on TikTok. Some of them are doing okay, but some of them not. A lot of them has to do with for TikTok it has to do with lighting quality and right. stuff like that. And so mm. I'm a lot of times just shooting them with my phone like at some rant, like 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 right on whim at like some pool when I'm playing pool. So the lighting's not good and stuff like that, but I don't know. Is that do you guys want the tail end of this podcast to be a a tutorial about TikTok? No. <laughs> well, no, I thought we were doing good. Well, oh, you want to end it sounding smart. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, didn't, I just didn't know if you wanted me to explain to you my shitty abilities with TikTok. Hey, right man. Now, if you want me to. We just take it. All right, cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I started making these pool videos because I was Those are like, great. I love those. I got to keep doing it then because I was, I was kind of getting bored with... I was like, I'm finding... Instagram very stressful because of uh, how bad I am at it. I'm sorry, but that sounded funny. No, I know, I know. So I was like, I'll just do these TikTok ones. But yeah, the only time uh, I find Instagram stressful is when I'm like on the subway or on the bus, and I'm like, oh shit, you have no like, connection. No, no, no. <laughs> you get like you get like three booty girls oh, right fuck. in a row, oh, and yeah. I'm like, oh fuck, like I hope nobody. Sees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, what am you I? Open it up for you, lady. <laughs> And she's like, what the fuck? What the like, ah, oh, the algorithm made me look at yeah. it. It's a magazine on the phone. <laughs> yeah. That's really what it is. Mm-hmm. Your yeah. algorithm is just a magazine on your phone. You just like get to flick, 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 flick. I read no books now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not. I, I, have, I struggle making it through full books. My eyes get all cross-eyed and shit. I'm like, oh, my God. Full. Oh, we got a full book reader. I need over reading here. glasses now too. Oh, I, I use reading glasses, man. It's crazy. <laughs> See what you got yourself into? Yeah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you at home, I'm. Uh, I just finished drinking my bottle of water, but uh, to my left, there's a, a gentleman with four uh, cans of Rolling Rock and a bunch of shots of rum in the belly, and the. Uh, same to my gentleman to the right, and a multiple edible situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, listen, you already did your your. Where can I find me? Where can everybody find me? We should have ended this shit like ten minutes ago, but um, yeah. And we'll wrap it up. But I just wanted to say thank you, man, for coming through. I'm yeah. psyched to be here. I appreciate yeah. you having it me. Was man. Like, you had fun? Yeah, and it, it really meant a lot to me when you when uh when I saw you and I was like, hey man, I hadn't seen you in a while. I know last time it was kind of rough, and then you weren't just happy to see me. You invited me to come do the podcast. Yeah. That made me feel great actually. Oh, awesome. It really did. I'm so glad. Oh, well, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, right on, man. We'll yeah. do it again too. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah, yeah. I had fun. I had a fucking ball. I, I left my fucking ass, ass off tonight. You, man. Good, good, you did man. your job, man. I left my fucking ass off tonight. Cool. Thank you, guys. <laughs> yeah, man. You got a career in front of you. I think you could do something <laughs> with this comedy. <laughs> this next 20 years will be good, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> oh, fuck. Once again, I want to thank our guest, John F. O'Donnell, for coming by and joining us on the show. Don't forget to check us out on Instagram at the Tiger Pit Podcast and our new YouTube channel. Take it easy.